Hey, it's Patrick here from Kintsugi Hope. It is so brilliant to be with you and I hope your family are safe at this time and uh, and I'm broadcasting from my home to yours. Um, so um, it's really a privilege for me. Um, a lot of people say, what on earth does the word Kintsugi mean? Well, Kintsugi is a Japanese word. It means golden joinery. And the whole idea is we break a bowl and uh, we mend it with super glue, I guess, in this country. And what they do in Japan is they put a gold powder in the glue. So instead of hiding the cracks, they make a feature of the cracks. Arguably, the object becomes more beautiful than it was before. It certainly becomes more unique because beauty comes from brokenness. That Our scars are ne they're not there to be ashamed of. Our scars make us who we are. So me and my wife died and we started a charity called Kintsugi Hope to tackle two big issues social isolation and mental health and of course they're some of the biggest issues that our society is facing today and we simply do this by running a 12-week program uh, similar to the AA Alcoholics Anonymous but around well-being. I sort of describe it like a bit of Weight Watchers for well-being. Um, you get some tools, you get some techniques to help with issues around anxiety and anger and self-acceptance and you're doing peer support and it is all written in learning style so one size never fits all so we're trying to adapt to different groups of people. And uh, we are literally training churches up online across the country to run this. Um, so if you know of anyone's interested, any other church, your church, whatever, um, get involved. Um, it'll be brilliant to help train you guys to get ready for what will be a tsunami of mental health issues when we come out of lockdown. One of the biggest challenges I face in being in lockdown and just this period with the coronavirus is this whole area of perfectionism. And uh, I never used to think I was a perfectionist because I always thought they were the people that parents just put on too much pressure on them when they were at school. But when I looked into perfectionism, oh my goodness, I realised that I am such a perfectionism, a perfectionist. Um, yeah, I didn't even say the word perfectionism right now. Shall I edit that? Or because it's on perfectionism, shall I just let it go? I'm going to let it go. Um, but the reality is that if perfectionism is not dealt with, it can lead and really affect our emotions and leads to depression, anger and anxiety. And David Byrne says this, perfectionists are people whose standards are so high beyond reach or reason. They strain compulsively and unremittedly towards impossible goals and measure their own worth entirely in terms of productivity and accomplishment. The five characteristics of perfectionists are procrastination, fear of failure, the all or nothing mindset, paralysed perfectionism, and you can become a workaholic. And if not careful, we start to make really unhealthy demands on our family and friends. And, uh, you know, Anne Wilson said this, perfectionism is self-abuse of the highest order. Uh, it feels like, you know, a hamster it goes round and round and round on the wheel and just keeps pedalling faster and faster um, in order to um, just keep going. Uh, Wendy Bray, this brilliant quote. We find ourselves spinning hard and faster in endless rounds of unrealistic goals and expectations, growing dizzy in the face of what we see as failure, even when we know our own success, because perfection sometimes reduces its own effectiveness. Now, perfectionism um, reveals itself in various different ways. I don't know if you can recognise any of these in yourself. Uh, when I read this list, I was like, oh my goodness, this makes so much sense now of who I am and what I, why I do stuff. So perfectionism can reveal itself in catastrophic thinking. The smallest disagreement with a friend or a minimal mistake at work becomes the end of the world. You know, me and Diamond might have a, a, a row about the tiniest things and I'll be like, that's it. Is the end of our marriage and she's like oh my goodness you've just blown this out of proportion um i'll get up and make you a cup of tea it's okay um mind reading we think we know what others think about us and nine times out of ten it is not positive and they might not be thinking about us at all but what we do is we think they are and uh, and that they're judging us negatively we set ourselves unrealistic expectations we have this rigid belief system which uses words like must ought, should, I must please everyone all the time, you ought to do better, I should always be in control, it's about duty and obligation, and we hate making mistakes, I hate letting people down, overcompensating, oh my goodness, sometimes I work so hard in order to get things right, and you know, we overcompensate in our behaviour, pushing ourselves to the limit, excessive text che uh, checking, Who's ever done this? You, you, you've sent a text and then you check it again or check an email and then you recheck it. And, you know, actually this can develop into OCD. We've become people who need constant reassurance. Procrastination. 
Making decisions, often small ones due to the fear of failure. We can't meet the demands that we set ourselves. And sometimes we delay trying and the smallest decision can just stress us out. You know, next one, it's very hard to take constructive criticism or praise. Um, I tend not to watch some of these videos back, but sometimes I need to check them. And I sit there going, oh my goodness, you idiot. Why didn't you say it like this? Um, if you said it like that, it would have been much more understandable. And uh, and then people sometimes email me going, oh, that's amazing. You know, thank you so much for that lovely talk. And I'm like, oh, they're Christians. They're just being kind. Um, they have to do that. You know, it's part of the sort of job description. I find it hard to accept praise. Failure to celebrate achievements. Um, whatever I do is not enough. People tell you you're doing an amazing job, you're a great mum, you're a great sister, you're a great worker, but actually we don't accept ourselves. And so it's really, really, really tough. Um, my people pleasing habit, you know, I don't want to risk upsetting people. I need the perfect relationship. So what we can do is we can often rehearse and relive incidences and conversations and events. You really need to hear my heart here. High expectations and clear goals are not bad in themselves. Uh, it is good to do the best that we can do and become the best that we can become. But when it starts being so rigid and lacking kindness, and we start to believe these um, core beliefs, that perfection is often core belief that you know, I'm worthless, I'm terrible, I'm inadequate, um, I never match up, I'm unlovable. Uh, my really good friend, Will van der Hart, says this, perfectionism thrives when you believe you're in more control than you really are, which is also ironically the illusion that perfectionism wants to offer you. Many Christians struggle with perfectionism and fear that they're letting themselves off the hook or passing the buck if they don't assume uh, complete responsibility, less than complete responsibility for everything. So... The question is, where does perfectionism come from? We are all born with certain characteristics. Um, our emotional behavioural responses can be affected and orientated by the experiences of life. Um, some of our parents have been absorbed by anxiety. Um, there is issues sometimes of lack of affirmation, unfair expectations at school, but also behavioural. Um, but, you know, the fact is, is what we have to come to realisation is that God doesn't want perfection. He, he looks at our heart. You know, 1 Samuel 16 verse 7 says this, The Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks on the outside appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Our job is to make sure that our heart is right before God. God rejoices in the best that we can do. It's interesting, even at the beginning in creation, you know, God looked at the creation. He didn't say it was perfect. Actually, he said it was good. We need to set ourselves in this time of the coronavirus and lockdown, realistic goals and flexible goals. There's a verse around this that's affected so many people, Christians and non-Christians. And it comes from Matthew 5 verse 48. It says this, be perfect therefore as your heavenly father is perfect. Now the key about this verse is the Hebrew understanding for perfect means moving towards fulfillment, uh, moving towards completion. Um, the, compl the translation here, particularly in the NIV, it, it, is not great. Um, the word uh, perfect is telos, completion, wholeheartedness, being authentic, integrity. And it's interesting that Brené Brown, the uh, famous research professor from the States, has written so many amazing books um, on this topic, says the opposite to perfectionism is actually wholeheartedness, is being authentic. So it's almost like this verse is the opposite. It's saying the opposite to what we think it's saying. It's talking about completion, wholeheartedness, authenticity, and it's written in the context, actually, of um, Jesus saying you need to love your enemies. And of course, we know the Greeks had this whole thing about perfection in terms of their art, in terms of their sport. God says, you know what? It's good. It doesn't have to be perfect. And so we really need to try and understand. Um, some of you know that I have four kids. Abigail, um, my... Um, uh, uh, she's 11 and uh, she has special additional needs and uh, she can get really frustrated by others and uh, she will never get a GCSE but she probably gets A for effort well she does get A for effort in every single subject and yet so often um, we don't award people on effort we award them on a bit statistic and uh, I noticed at the end of term there was this school assembly where everyone gets A for attendance and uh, Abby will never get A for attendance she's got too many hospital appointments 
But I noticed what happens with the kids is they all come in the hall and they're all a bit nervous. And Abby's quite nervous because she can't see as well as some of the other kids. And so she's looking for the eyes of her dad. And, uh, and all the kids come in and what they do is they're looking for their parents. And when they find their parents, they all do this. And then you look around and all the parents are doing that as well. And, uh, and Abby, uh, she looks at me, she sees my eyes and she's like, and I'm like, and I realise that when she sees her dad's eyes, or her mum's eyes, everything's going to be okay. And I guess I've really struggled with what does success look like. And I've come to the conclusion is I've just got to spot my dad's eyes. I got to spot my father's of God's eyes and success for me has come uh, thinking about I need to live by my values. You know, Kintsugi Hope is a beautiful charity, but it does not matter to me now whether it becomes the biggest charity on the planet. I want to be effective and success for me is following my heart, following that calling that God has put in me. So my prayer for you uh, as we go for this stage in the coronavirus is actually you show yourself some self-compassion. Um, you may have heard me say many times before, self-compassion and self-indulgence, two very different things. Self-compassion is talking to yourself the way that you would talk to your best friend. Treating yourself with love, kindness and gentleness. It's not being selfish. It's meaning that you're not giving out of an empty cup so you can give to others. May God bless you and, uh, and uh, be with you during this time. Father God, bless the people that are watching this little film. And I pray that they would know they are loved and how cared for they are in the name of Jesus. Amen.